Hola amigos! You know, we motorcycle riders are pretty friendly and welcoming community for new members. And we always ready to give a couple of really good advices to a beginner rider. But sometimes somebody, of course not us, but somebody, can give this beginner rider some pretty stupid myth instead of good stuff. That's why in this video I want to talk about 10 of such not so very good tips. Of course there are much more than 10 of them, but these are just which I personally could remember right away. More importantly, I picked the advices that uh, can seem pretty convincing at first, so much that I even think some people in comment section will strongly disagree with this video, which is completely normal by the way. That's why later this video will have the second part, in which we'll talk about how we usually can distinguish a really good advice from the one which just seems good. Ok, vamos! Let's go! I split today's 10 meat in 3 groups. There will be some advices about bikes themselves and about riding techniques. But the first bunch will be some general advices for beginner riders, more like about the attitude towards the whole motorcycling thing. First one can sound like this. Come on, bro, riding is not a rocket science, just ride, bro. Put on some miles, you'll get it eventually. Sounds reasonable, but there are several problems with this. Though riding a bike is indeed not a rocket science, it's nonetheless not a very simple thing either. It is considerably more challenging than, let's say, driving the car. Just for example, your car won't do this if you stomp on your gas too fast. Or this if you brake too much. And it certainly won't tip over if you are not careful enough with your clutch. And in case something goes wrong, stakes are higher. When in the car you'll end up buying a new fender, on the bike you can easily end up in ambulance. My point is, with bikes even pretty basic things, like going through the corner, making a U-turn, riding slowly in the traffic, braking fast, all this stuff requires at least some level of riding skill. And yes, eventually you'll pick some of it just by riding around, but definitely not enough to deal with emergency situations, which eventually always happen. To learn what you and your bike are capable of, you'll have to push your limit at least a little. In normal everyday riding there is not really too much challenge. And anyway, it is not a very bright idea to push your limits on a public road. That's why in order to prepare yourself for inevitable emergencies on the road, as a biker you should always seek new knowledge, try new riding techniques and spend some quality training time with your bike, pushing yourself a little in controlled conditions. Just putting miles on the roads unfortunately won't suffice. After all, bikes are statistically 30 times more dangerous than cars, so we simply have to be more trained and know more stuff just to compensate for it. Second not very good advice which I sometimes see is that apart from helmet you don't really need any protective gear. Just ride carefully, don't get into accidents and you'll be fine. And wearing full gear is actually worse, because you feel protected, uh, so you are willing to take more risk. Well, I think it's pretty safe to assume that vast majority of riders who were in accidents had no plans to ever be in accident. So unfortunately the plan of just riding carefully and avoiding accidents doesn't work, because obviously not everything on the road depends on us. Yes, if we use defensive riding techniques, we can prevent the most common accident scenarios, but not all of them. Sometimes on the road completely unpredictable shit happens. That's just the way it is. The point of feeling invincible and taking risks is interesting. Some people can actually be like that. And this is the closest thing we've ever seen to full bomb-proof protection, bomb-proof protection, bomb-proof protection. Bomb-proof protection. But here we need to understand what protective gear actually does. It can't really protect us from slamming head-on into the wall at 100 miles per hour. And really it doesn't need to, because that's pretty rare case. Statistically, the median of collision speed with bikes is below 30 miles per hour. At this speed protective gear is pretty effective. With good gear on 30 miles per hour collision, we have pretty high chances to get away without any serious damage to our body. 
So yes, we should understand that gear doesn't turn us into the Terminator, but it is pretty effective on average collision speed. Next, not very good advice in my opinion, sounds like this, ride like everybody wants to kill you. Again, sounds pretty cool, makes you feel like a real badass, a lone wolf against the whole world. But usually it doesn't last long. Our brain tends to adapt itself very fast to a constantly hazardous situation. You are going to ride a couple of months waiting everyone to hit you, but eventually your brain will see that really nothing dangerous happens. So gradually you'll start to become less and less vigilant, paying less and less attention to the road, and you'll start to catch your mind drifting away more and more frequently. The point is that realistically you just can't always ride like you are constantly in grave danger, like everyone wants to kill. And it's simply not true. The much more effective approach, in my opinion, is defensive riding. When you know the common possible road accident scenarios, and you're constantly looking for possible dangerous situations on the road, and you react on it to prevent the accident from happening altogether. This way you don't just fear everybody around in general and waiting for them to kill you. You are looking for specific common patterns on the road, which can tell you the potentially dangerous situation. You are constantly scanning the road situation in a sense. And with this approach, with time, you only become better, because your brain will start to find those road patterns faster and easier. With practice, you will start to monitor the situation on the road almost automatically. So don't just have this mantra that uh, everybody on the road wants to kill you. Spend some time learning the actual road strategy, learn the most common hazards and keep looking for them. This is usually a much more effective approach for most riders. Now let's move on to some myth about actual riding process. First one will be the bike naturally follows your vision. This you can hear very often. Just look where you want to go and bike will naturally go in this direction. And don't get me wrong, your vision technique is a very important thing. And for the most time the idea of looking where you want to go is a very good idea. But the explanation that your bike naturally follows your vision is just a severe oversimplification. It is very important to understand that with our vision we only gather all the important information about our surroundings. And based on this information we decide where we want to go on our bike. And then we actually perform the maneuver. And we certainly perform it not with our vision, but with controls – steering, braking, throttle, etc. We still do need to work on it. Just looking where we want to go is not nearly enough. For example, let's look at offset weave exercise from our slow speed course. Here we can actually see bits where we turn our head and look really far over our shoulder. And only after some time we consciously make the bike enter the turn. This is actually pretty important, because this way we make ourselves look into the turn first, assess the turn and only then make the turn. And it perfectly makes sense. It is always good to know where you are going before you go there, right? My point here is that it's important to understand how exactly you turn your bike. It doesn't just automatically go where you look, it's not really like that. Next thing will be this. Counter steering only works at high speeds, above 20, 30, 40 miles per hour, etc. No, it doesn't, it simply doesn't. Here is the demonstration. As you can see, I'm going quite slow and look, counter steering to the right, bike starts to lean left, the front wheel turns itself into the turn and bike goes left. Job done, counter steering worked amazing. Why people may think that counter steering works only fast speeds? That's because on faster speed, doing big turns, we have much more time to understand what's going on. When at speed we push the handlebar, our bike starts slowly banking. And it quickly becomes quite obvious, then when we push left handlebar, we go left, and when we push right, we go right. On slower speeds, our bike is much less stable, and if we turn the handlebars, it starts to tip very fast. Plus, at slow speeds, other factors, like our body position and movement, can have greater impact. So, if we don't know the theory, 
it's very hard to understand what's going on, because everything happens pretty fast. And that's why there are a lot of people who think that uh, there is some magical speed number, above which counter steering works and doesn't work below. If you happen to be new to the channel, I have a detailed video about counter steering on motorcycles, how it exactly works and why it is the most effective way to change your bike direction. I leave a link below this video. Check it out, it's pretty important. Next straight up bad advice, which a beginner rider can hear, is never break the corner. The idea is that uh, if you enter the corner and your bike has whatever bank angle, if you apply brakes, you'll crash instantly. And again, at first glance, it makes sense. We all have seen lots of times uh, when people start to break the corner and then crash. But in reality, most of those people crashed not just because they dared to apply the brakes mid-corner. It's because they applied them in the wrong way. Panic braking, when we just suddenly grab our brakes with all our force, is usually a pretty bad idea. And not only in corners. This way we can easily crash on a straight line too. In corners, uh, it just becomes more obvious, because we already are spending a significant portion of our traction on lateral cornering forces. Which means, if we want to brake successfully mid-corner, we have to be even more smooth and precise with our brakes than usual. So, this advice really should sound more like never suddenly smash your brakes in panic mid-corner. And please, uh, practice your braking technique regularly, so you can Stay calm and don't panic in case of emergency. The next advice is again about cornering. Always lean your body into the turn. This one is pretty interesting actually, because it has a legit foundation. Uh, the main idea is this. Uh, by leaning your body into the turn, you reduce the lean angle of your bike. This way it stays more perpendicular to the road, uh, which in turn means uh, that your suspension works better, providing you with more traction. And all this is true. Uh, that's exactly why in road racing we always see riders hanging off their bikes into the turn really far. In racing, every bit of extra traction is very important, because more traction means more cornering speed. Us, regular riders, though, uh, we have a luxury of not constantly pushing ourselves right to the edge, where every bit of traction matters. But we have to consider some other things. For example, by hanging ourselves uh, from the bike, we can no longer see what happens in our mirrors. Sometimes it can be pretty important. Or by hanging off in a blind turn, we can see less into it, because our head and eyes now are closer to the inner side of the corner. In this situation, sometimes it can even be beneficial if we slow down a little and place our body more to outside of the corner to see better into it. Yes, it will increase our lean angle a little, but in this particular case, the extra visibility can be worth a trade-off. So, my main point here is that yes, shifting your body weight into the turn can be beneficial, but uh, it doesn't mean that you have to do it on every single corner. Most of the time, it is just not necessary. And now, let's move on to the last bunch of advices, which will be about bikes themselves. First one goes like this. Buy a bigger bike. Don't waste your time with a small one. You'll become bored with it quickly. No, that's straight up bad advice. In fact, starting with smaller bike usually is a great idea, and I even recently made a whole video why. Basically, smaller bike lets you master basic riding techniques easier, faster and cheaper. And even if you become bored with it eventually, you always can sell it and buy something bigger. After all, you're just buying a motorcycle, not marrying it. And the whole you'll quickly become bored talk uh, usually goes from people who just ride in a straight line. Just opening throttle and accelerating in a straight line really is not that difficult, uh, so our brain quickly adapts to pretty much any motorcycle. I need just a little bit more power, it'll always be like that. That's how they sell us new bikes and that's why we have the whole aftermarket for these bikes. 
which neatly brings us to the aftermarket myth. Ditch the stock pipes, bro. Loud pipes save lives. You gotta have a straight one, bro. Seems reasonable. If you have loud exhaust, uh, that's more chance to people to hear you. And that means more safety. But the question here is how much safer it becomes. Your exhaust faces rearwards, so the majority of the sound goes that way, not forward, where you really want it. Yes, low sound frequencies from your exhaust travel in all directions, but uh, this in turn means that people in front of you have no idea where this sound is coming from. In this regard, the horn, which you have in stock, works much better. So yeah, with loud exhaust, it's slightly greater chance to notice you, but really not that much greater chance. Uh, and if you consider that uh, you usually have to pay a couple of grand for the pipe and ECU tuning, uh, if you spend this money on safety courses and trade days, you'll actually become much safer rider. Statistically, at least two times safer to be precise. If you chase safety, you don't really need aftermarket exhaust. Uh, you may get it because it sounds and looks cool, but it has nothing to do with safety. It's just because straight pipe sounds cool and that's it. And the last bad advice for today is about tires. Put on wider rear tire, because wider tire gives you better traction. Again, at first glance, sounds reasonable. Wider tire gives us bigger contact patch. Bigger contact patch gives us better traction, which is always good. After all, look at those MotoGP bikes. They have a really flat rear tire. And what is good for MotoGP is good for us, right? There are several issues with this. First and the most obvious is you shouldn't just stick wider rear tire on your bike because each tire size is built for a certain wheel rim width. If you just put wide tire on your rim, uh, the tire bit won't sit properly on the rim. Uh, the sidewall becomes stressed and when you start taking corners, the side load causes your tire to flex out of shape too much and your whole tail starts to wobble, which certainly won't contribute to your cornering in a positive way. So, to fit wider tires, uh, you need much and wider rims, that's first. Second, tire width is always a compromise between how much extra contact patch you have and how fast you can tip your bike. Bigger, heavier and more powerful bikes are forced to have bigger contact patch to apply their weight and power to. Uh, this comes at cost of maneuverability. And at last, all geometrical properties of your bike, such as tire size, wheelbase, caster angle, rake, trail, etc. All this stuff is interrelated and greatly affects handling of your motorcycle. Unless you know precisely what you are doing, messing around with your bike geometry will most certainly make it handle worse. With all that being said, fitting a wider tire for better traction is a bad idea. Well, why I suddenly changed my clothing? Uh, that's because originally I wanted to record this video in two parts, uh, but after I recorded the first one, I realized that it's a stupid idea, it's better to keep these two parts together. This second part is about how we can usually spot bad advices about riding bikes. What gives them away? First one, which is by far the most common, is years and miles argument. Examples. You don't need to wear a helmet. I rode for 20 years without a helmet and I'm fine. I rode 300,000 miles with car tire and never had an issue. There are two major problems with years and miles argument. First, we don't know how exactly our hero rode for 20 years. You can ride for 20 years on daily basis or once every couple of months. Uh, you can ride from bar to bar on a completely straight road at 30 miles per hour, or you can carve the twists in Alps. Same with mileage. If our guy rode his 300,000 miles by riding on straight line on highways, no wonder he never had an issue with his car tire on the back. He never leaned his bike in the first place. Obviously, this information is very important and has to be considered. But what even more important is that years and miles argument has large survivorship bias. It just happens that some people can claim that they rode without a helmet for 20 years. And they are fine. But at the same time, there are a lot of other people who also rode without helmets, but they are no longer fine and they can't tell us their story anymore. 
As a result, we can hear more people telling us that it's okay to ride without a helmet, which is obviously not true. So the years and miles argument alone doesn't matter very much, don't pay it too much attention. Usually people use it uh, when they have no real argument. Second common argument of similar nature is herd mentality, which implies that if a lot of people are doing something, that's always good. Like for example, in a lot of countries, like India, Vietnam, Turkey or even here in Argentina, quite a lot of people ride with no gear, often even without helmets. And if so many people ride without gear, it means that's ok, right? Again, here we need some context. Uh, riding around some Asian town at 20 miles per hour on a scooter is one thing. Riding at 1250GS on autobahn at uh, 120 is a completely another story. And obviously it requires completely another set of gear. Plus, most people ride like that not because it's actually better practice, but for a whole bunch of different reasons, like cost of gear or its availability. And a lot of people simply don't even bother thinking about it in the first place. It's like uh, with seat belts back in the day. Vast majority of people didn't use them pretty much just because they haven't thought about doing it. Now, through the magic of education and a bunch of tickets, uh, suddenly almost everybody use the seat belt. So just because everybody does something doesn't mean that you need to do it too. It may be a good reason to investigate this matter further, but it shouldn't be a sole reason to do something. Third argument, uh, which screams bad advice, is what I like to call the cargo cult. Just like some Melanesian tribes once tried to mimic the visual appearance of planes and airports without having a clue on how they work in attempt to have some goods dropped on them. A lot of riders tend to mimic advanced riding stuff without understanding of what they are actually doing. Great example is putting the fat rear tire in hope that it gets more traction. Or hanging off a bike at uh, every possible chance. Before doing so, make sure you actually understand the main reason and mechanics of what are you trying to do. Don't just do something because it appears that Valentino Rossi does the same thing. You are in a completely different set of circumstances, so you may obviously act differently than him. Next pretty alarming sign is oversimplification attempts, especially when somebody can't explain how exactly some technique works. Examples. Always push on the outer foot pack, it just works. Or just turn your head and your bike will follow your head naturally. The problem with this approach is that uh, some technique which just works for one person on a specific bike might not work for another person on another bike. We all have different height and weight and bikes are obviously quite different. So uh, when one person is comfortably hanging off the bike with all his weight on outer peg, doesn't mean that each and everyone will be comfortable too. And by oversimplifying things too much, we can end up missing some very important steps, like with our vision. If we just look where we want to go, uh, we probably will miss a whole bunch of stuff, like slow speed counter steering, turning head before counter steering and uh, the correlation between speed and turning radius. So, in my opinion, if somebody tells you to do something because it just works, without actually explaining what's going on, take it with a great pinch of salt, don't just believe it immediately. And last reason, often used in the bad riding advices, is don't be a chicken type. Like for example, uh, the whole chicken strips thing. Uh, if you don't lean enough to scrub the whole tire, you're a chicken. Or with bikes, uh, buy a liter sport bike, what, you're a pussy? The whole point of this argument is usually not to help you with a good advice, but uh, more to boost the advisor's confidence at your expense. So when you hear that, just ignore it, usually it's the best strategy. Ok, that's enough for today. If you have some questions, put them down in the comment section. Also, you can check these videos for better understanding of motorcycle riding techniques. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel, because I am translating more and more videos from my Russian channel, and I think you will like them very much. As always, thank you for watching and hope to see you soon. Adios!